25 years, Bill? 20, 20 oh God. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, I, well, I, I was an English professor. He, he, he's a biologist. He knows more than, more than I do about uh, plants, but I can still take a poem apart. <laughs> My whole life has revolved around uh, alcohol. It, uh, it's, it's been the, the center uh, symbol and the, um, the center um, uh, device which has generated action, whatever actions occurred in my life, including my life before I um, started drinking myself, as, as I look, look back on it, because my uh, father was an active uh, practicing alcoholic, although interestingly, you know, I never saw my dad uh, drunk, staggering, or never abusive. Or I, in fact, I never heard him, heard him swear. He was a very loving uh, man who uh, we could always tell when he was opening another Budweiser in the kitchen because he would cough. And for years and years and years, he thought the cough covered the, you know. <laughs> and he would just kind of stay, I think he stayed kind of loaded for about 30 years, uh, really. He, he would, from time to time, bounce up the dose with a shot of whiskey, but never never at home. It was always out in tavern saloons. And back in those days, 40, 50 years ago, there were saloons and taverns at every corner. People didn't drive as much. And uh, you would meet in saloons for a drink. And in fact, I remember they, them sending me down. To, you, you could be young. There were, there were, no one really cared. And bringing up a bucket of beer. You know, pay 50 cents for a whole bucket and carry it up, sloshing foam around and putting it down on the table. And everyone dips his or her glass in the, in the, in the bucket. And uh, so I, I kind of grew up thinking that women really ruled the roost. Women kept the families going. And men kind of drank and worked and brought home checks and drank and partied and brought home checks and went out and so on. And then uh, died of uh, cirrhosis or a heart attack or stroke or something in their late 40s or 50s. That, that was the pattern in the, the families I knew. This was in the south side of Chicago, immigrant families from... Uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, th these uh, Austria, these uh, countries, um, and so I and so I grew up that way, and uh, I thought that uh, faith would would be enough to cure alcoholism because that's what I was told, and uh, periodically the uh, Catholic uh, priests would uh, kind of more or less round up the practicing alcoholics and bring them to a special. Ceremony and it was called a Pioneer Society, and they take a pledge to n not touch the stuff for like six months or three months. You could have your choice, a year and so on. And it was a very holy occasion. And everyone would take the pledge, and they'll be drunk within a few days, of course. And it, I think, it taught me subconsciously that faith, at least so far as I was concerned, was not enough. It wasn't enough just to ask for, for some uh, deliverance from the. Almighty Creator. I mean, I saw lots of men and women die uh, doing that. Uh, they, 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 they believed they were really good people. But I, I think this is the point. They didn't realize they were in a grip of an obsession that was going to lead them to death. No, I mean, no one really knew that. Uh, again, I was raised to think that, uh, that uh, it was an issue of, um, of morality and an issue of faith. If you, were, if you were strong inside, and if you believed in God, um, you could work, you could work uh, this out. So that was my upbringing. So imagine how I felt as I'm a, a young man in his uh, 20s, and I'm, I'm beginning to drink a lot. And uh, I'm thinking, well, I can stop this anytime. Uh, I want and so on, and I excused it uh, on an intellectual basis because uh, I uh, was moving toward a, a graduate degrees in the university and thought of myself as a young, promising novelist. I wanted to win the Nobel Prize. My my heroes in life were Ezra Pound and Hemingway and Faulkner, Scott Fitzgerald, and I wanted to be like them. I emulated them. I tried to write like them, and above all, I tried to drink as I thought they they drank. Uh, I thought it was a necessary part of being a sophisticate, and uh, I thought it wise and proper to worry about the disintegration of, of Western culture rather than uh, worry about my own life. Uh, 
I, uh, I, I, I had everything backwards, you know. It never occurred to me that maybe if I really wanted to change the world that I should straighten my own life out. I thought, no, I'd straighten the universe out first. And then if there was any time left, I'd straighten, straighten myself uh, uh, out. And uh, I, met, I met Jan, and uh, she, she, is, she has such good sense. I think she temporarily went insane and married me. I don't know. But uh, she did, thank, thank God. It was the greatest event, I think, uh, of my life. And Jan, after Jan and I were married, we went uh, uh, out to uh, California, to uh, University of Southern California for my uh, Ph.D., where I really began to drink a lot. And my, little, my dirty little secret is I'm really something of a coward, I think. You, know? you can dress it up and say, well, I'm fearful. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nicer word, isn't it? Uh, I mean, I think I was scared, uh, just chicken, just a coward, about a lot of things, uh, about authority, about achieving, about women, uh, about being sufficiently aggressive to, to mark my way properly in the world. I, I, looking back on it, I just didn't, I didn't have any, any guts to speak of. And so uh, I just would opt out every day of the, the difficult graduate world and the, the fear of not making it and uh, because I had... Uh, uh, promised everyone, so to speak, that I was going to make it. And here I really wondered. What, what used to get me is that at, at Southern Cal, USC, it's a typical university, there are maybe uh, seven or 8,000 graduate students then. And you go to graduation ceremony and like there are two PhDs granted. Uh, you don't have to be a mathematical genius to figure out that, that something's going on here and it's not graduation. Uh, there are a lot of people who, in fact, the vast, vast majority who start these degrees don't... Uh, finish them for one reason or another and I thought well can I you know can I do it well instead of studying more diligently or seeking counseling help or anything of the sort I drank more you understand that I mean that was the way I really faced that problem and uh, as I drank I just fantasized that this was the way to operate this was the intellectual uh, way uh, to operate so I did uh, finally pass all the uh, PhD uh, exams, quali so-called qualifying exams, which means your ABD, all but dissertation. You have to finish your first, your di your dissertation, in effect, a book. And uh, I, uh, it, but but you can get your first full-time job. Well, that sounded great. And so I got my first full-time job at the University of Arizona. Well, you know, wonderful place, and they really liked me. And I said, Fran, you know, we like you. We have wonderful plans for you. All you have to do is finish that dissertation. <laughs> and. Uh, so on. So Jan and I uh, went into a routine, which we kept up for four years. We would plan all week that this was the last week of drinking. And then s Sunday, we'd end up with a tremendous party. I mean, a real. Because, you know, you understand why it was the last one. And I had this pencil sharpened. I was all ready for the dissertation. But Monday, we were so incredibly hungover that we would have a little family conference. And we would say, you know, we've already uh, we wrecked this week. We've got to have kind of a taper down day or we'll get sick. And so we'd give up Monday. And then, of course, by the next time we talked, it was Tuesday. And we'd say, look, it's Tuesday. We screwed up this week. Let's have a last party, the coming Sunday. Now, I, I, I know you wouldn't really think, looking at me, I don't look that dumb, that I actually, honest, <laughs> honest to God, did this for four years, but I did. And I, I, I didn't write a single word of that dissertation. And uh, the university fired me. Well, they were polite about it. They didn't say it was for drinking. But you knew, you know, and I know it was because of uh, drinking. I just didn't think I had it in me. And I'd rather drink than write. And so the university bounced me out of there. And that's why I came up here, because the only place I could get a job was Gonzaga. I didn't want to come up here. Like most Californians, I thought the world ended when you came to northern Oregon or so and, and tried to go north. <laughs> was, there was nothing north of north Oregon, uh, I thought. But uh, beggars can't be choosers. You know, I was happy to have any kind of a job. Um, but I was really desolate uh, inside because I thought of myself as a moral uh, leper. And I, I was so ashamed of myself for what I had, the, 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 the ruin I had brought into Jan's life. Uh, although, uh, as she's, when she tells a story, she points out that she, in her mind, was a practicing alcoholic by that time. She was fully engaged in her own um, life of, uh, of drinking. Um, we, 
I, I can't tell you how ashamed and awful and terrible I, I, uh, I, I, I felt. I had no idea at that time that alcoholism was an, was an illness, a problem that af- afflicted bright and dumb, uh, old and young, male and female, and that it, it could be treated somehow. And you could get, not, if not exactly over it, you could learn to live with it and live productively. Th- those ideas were totally foreign to me. And I called AA in absolute desperation. I knew nothing about AA. I, I, to this day, I don't know uh, why I called AA. As a matter of fact, one of my, uh, and I'm sure many of you share this with me, but one of my feelings about drinking is that sobriety really genuinely, truly is a gift. That, that, that initial sobriety, that we, it's, it's a little tiny window in life where we get some sobriety and the chance to deal with AA, and we do or we don't, you know. And I suspect you all do because you're here. But, but we all know so many, you know, who didn't make that little window for one reason or another. They're, they're out there uh, uh, still. Well, I think that's what happened for me. Why I called AA, I don't know. Jan, Jan was angry uh, with me. But uh, because uh, she, what, what did you do that for? You know, what can these people tell, uh, tell us? I had tried, you know, I had already discovered in my life, at least as I've mentioned to you, that faith in itself wasn't enough. And I thought maybe knowledge uh, was enough. I, w- I was intelligent, and I started reading a lot about the etiology of, uh, of drinking. And uh, I started going to a uh, psychoanalyst who obligingly uh, called me a manic depressive and gave me all kinds of wonderful names and titles which I hung on to. And we, we looked into my own life and my relationship to my father and my mother and so on and so on. And I got a great deal of knowledge about myself. It didn't help one goddamn bit. I mean, I, I don't personally think that knowledge of your affliction uh, does, does much. I mean, it's kind of interesting in a way, but it's kind of an added parenthesis out there. I, I mean, I think what counts somehow, as I learned, are meetings and trying to do the right thing and living uh, according to these 12 principles as best, to, as best we can. That's what began uh, to work with me. But what astounded me at first in AA uh, was the uh, uh, release of moral uh, guilt. Now, I don't know how many of you agree or have gone through what I did, but that was very important to me, the fact that these AA members were wonderful people and they... God, they uh, they smiled at me and they hugged me and they, they said, you're, you're okay, you're just sick. I mean, you, you can get well. You're not a sinner. Satan does not live in you. You're not a moral reprobate. You, the, the, I can't tell you how important that was to me. That's still terribly important to me, the fact that you all accept me, not, not just as a human being, really, but as, kind of as a, as a nice guy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm all right, you know. You, 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 you love me and... Uh, Hugging to me is essential. Without hugging, I, I don't know what would, you know, would happen. I need that. I mean, I need uh, that, that look I see in your eyes. I, I need the smiles. I, I need all of that uh, very much. So, so we came up to uh, Gonzaga, and I plunged into the life of a teacher uh, here. And uh, to show you again how incredibly the, uh, and amazingly the, the program works, uh, my sponsor, uh, Paul, said to me, and uh, I want to tell you this anecdote because it's so expressive to me of the power of the program. He said, Fran, you're going to have to write uh, your dissertation committee at USC and tell them what's happened to you and ask for a chance again. See, by now the, the years, I think it was seven years or something, had run out, six years. Went. And so I, you know, pa- Paul uh, hadn't been... Uh, uh, to a uh, university uh, on, on that level, and I thought to him, I, and I thought, well, he doesn't really know, but <laughs> he's my sponsor. I'll humor him, okay? Huh? And I wrote a letter to humor my sponsor, and I wrote a letter, and I, for the, one of the first times in my life, I told the full truth. I said that I had a drinking problem and that I'd been released from University of Arizona, and I was now a professor uh, at uh, Gonzaga, and I wonder if it possible to have my Ph.D. committee reconstituted, so and so and so. Well, to my stunned amazement, I got a wonderfully warm letter back from the university saying, oh, we understand, it's terrific, and we, we admire the candor of your letter, and it, it touched all of us. And I couldn't believe it. You know, truth works. I had never been truthful before. 
And, and they said, we're reconstituting your, your committee for another two years. We're sorry, you'll have to pay your dissertation fee again. Who cares? You know, I have to pay it ten times over. And uh, so I sat down and wrote the dissertation. It poured right out of me. It was in there all the time. It was just like Dorothy in Oz. I mean, I, it was in there all the time. It just, and I think so much is in us all the time. We need a way to release it. And I think the program is that. Uh, is that really? So it poured out of me. I turned it in. They accepted it. I flew down there and defended, defended it, and uh, I finished the uh, PhD, cur courtesy of AA. It was AA PhD, and uh, so we plunged into 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 work with enthusiasm at uh, Gonzaga. Discovered it was a fine place, and of course discovered that Spokane is a wonderful place. To uh, bought a house, and uh, we adopted uh, Frank and and uh, Jenny. I had, I had drunk myself sterile, and that wasn't tough to do considering what I was drinking. Especially in Arizona, we used to drink uh, Oso Negro black beer. It was $4.75 a gallon. <laughs> Everyone went down to Nogales and, and bought it. So anyway, we adopted uh, Frank and Jenny, and uh, Frank is an attorney now. He's a wonderful son. He's, he graduated from Georgetown. He's an attorney in San Diego. And he's not an alcoholic. It's very interesting. You just can't get him interested, you know. You say, would you, would you like a drink, Frank, or iced tea? And he thinks. Like you need to think, you know. He said, I always say, what are you thinking about? And he said, uh, I'll have the iced tea. <laughs> and, or if he, get, if he gets the beer, it sits there, you know, and he doesn't drink it. And I, I, Frank, you're, you're hopeless. You're not going to. Uh, but 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 Jenny is Jenny is approaching her fifth uh, I think it's her fifth uh, birthday and she understands us she she's uh, she's uh, one of us well they're the two greatest children in the world and so you can imagine how how thankful I am that that they came into our lives as they did each just a month uh, a month old so Jan and I plunged into the program and Paul had said and and uh, he was kind of a god to us our, this is our sponsor he died shortly after from a heart attack. But he said to us that he said you he said you two are always going to have to remain in service because you need, you need the stimulation of that and in in my judgment as he said this over and over again sobriety is in the steps but uh, j the joy you want is in the, is in uh, service and and I I've always passed that on because I think he was uh, I think he was right and he made another point about me he, he could see me he said Fran he said you need uh, you 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 need a certain kind of activity. You you need to be constantly giving somehow to feel feel good about yourself. And he said, I he said personally, I wouldn't try to change that. Just adapt, adapt to it. Just to decide that that's what your uh, root in life should be. Just to just to give in the sense. And so and so I have, and uh, I've I've loved I've loved every minute. I've loved every uh, day of it. Uh, it. It all kind of dovetailed together, and that. Twelve-step work is is similar to trying to be a good professor in the in the, in the classroom. Uh, the, the, so much of it is is the same. Uh, the impulse to help, the impulse to try, and again, you, it's it's the same too in what you get uh, what you get back. I uh, I, I loved it, and uh, Jan felt the same way. And so uh, we by, by by now it's really kind of true. We're we're about past everything. We we were both. Uh, uh, area. We both had a number of area positions, including air, uh, area chair, and uh, we were both a uh, delegate. And uh, I just finished eight years in in New York as a uh, trustee. I counted up the 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 trips. It was about 63 trips back and forth to New York as trustee, and I enjoyed every mile of it. I loved it. Stayed at the wonderful hotel at 48th and. Uh, Broadway and served on various trustee committees. I chaired the literature committee for a number of years, which we, again, which is the point with the trustees is to try to give you assignments which fit your your background, so you can use your professional expertise for the for the good of the uh, fellowship. And uh, there are 21 uh, uh, trustees, 14 Class Bs, and seven uh, Class As. The Class As, the non-drinking, and it's just an incredible experience to be around. These wonderful, loving uh, people, men and women, who give of themselves for the for the good of the fellowship, and uh, the adventures I've had there are just so uh, so legion. I I, I want to tell you a few of them just uh, because I think they're of uh, uh, of interest. Um, 
I had the I had the good fortune of knowing uh, quite a number of those who put the big book uh, together. I was good friends with Lois, Bill's uh, wife. I, n- I never, I- interestingly to me at least, I never met Bill. It just it, it, it comedy of errors, but I, I I didn't, and he died, much to my sorrow before uh, before I did. But uh, some anecdotes about what it was uh, like. Uh, it was and still is so incredibly uh, open and uh, honest. Uh, I remember the first uh, banquet I went to in New York, and that I was very very nervous at the time. I was the Washington area delegate, and I walked to the uh, big banquet room, and I was a little late. Everyone was sitting down at round tables in there, and I noticed there was no uh, dais around. Incidentally. In in New York, with the trustees, etc., at the many meetings, there is never a head uh, table. Never never saw one in eight years, which I think is interesting. Just people are just scattered. Oh. Well, anyway, there was a man standing outside the door, and he was smoking. And I walked up to him, and I thought he was the doorman. And I I said, "I'm Fran Pollock, a delegate from Washington area. Do do you know where I sit? Are the tables numbered, or you know whatever?" And, and he said, oh, hell, he said, I don't know, sit wherever you want. I'm just out here having a cigarette. And, and, uh, so, <laughs> so I went in, and there was one table with some empty chairs in it, and I sat down, and I looked up, and I was sitting next to Lois, accidentally. Like, oh, God, I'm, what, you know, what do you say to Bill's wife? I mean, I, 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 was, I was really acutely embarrassed, but she immediately put me at, at my ease and had, had a wonderful conversation and that was the beginning of, of both Jan and Fran getting to know Lois uh, rather well. We'd be out at, at Stepping Stones uh, in Bedford Hills, their uh, estate. It's, it's about seven acres or so, which of course for that part of the country is really big. Maybe I'm exaggerating, I usually do. <laughs> but uh, uh, but you know, uh, the, the Bill's little kind of writing shack is uh, away, about fifty yards away from the house, and you can go in there and sit down in his chair, and, and you can see the view he had when he was uh, writing. And it's just it it really tickles you to do that. Uh, l- little things count. Like uh, he had a little toilet in there, and I noticed that. I I don't know about you other men, but I I can't go to the bathroom without having picking up something to read. Or something. I don't know. Maybe I've been an English professor too long, and and Bill had above the toilet a map, and he you could still still see the pins in it for the first meetings. There was one pin in there for Akron, and and I always have this strange vision of Bill going in there to use a toilet, standing up there observing w- where the meetings were and how AA was growing. And only a man would think of putting a map up there, because only a man would be standing up. <laughs> well, it's it, it's 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 funny. It's good. Um, but I uh, had always been fascinated uh, long before. Uh, this is an interesting story to me. I hope it is to you. I, I've been interested in. I, I had a, a philosophy minor in my uh, PhD, and uh, always been intensely interested in uh, philosophical thought, going back to the Pre-Platonics, and, and particularly with uh, uh, Plato com- coming on up to the uh, uh, present. And uh, James, William James interested me a great deal, particularly his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. And, I, you know, I had read that first when I was about 10 or 11 or, or 12, and it fascinated me because I had been raised a very strict Catholic, and there was only one God, and he was, this God was male and was worshipped in this particular way and so on. And in James' book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, he talks about multiple ways, multiple uh, concepts, that perhaps it had to do with the person rather than with some abstract uh, God, and that, uh, and James strongly made the point that all religious experiences seem to be kind of equal. In that, uh, if if John felt this was appropriate, then John was right. If Mary felt this was appropriate, then Mary was right. I again, the variety is religious experience. Well, you can imagine how fascinated I was when I came in the program and discovered that the variety of religious experience, as a book and as an idea, was very strong in Bill's mind, Bill Wilson's mind. You'll you'll see this in A Comes of Age if you. If you get curious yourself, or you probably have, have already. Well, that really tickled me and uh, fascinated me because I could see James' influence along with those first, I think, very, very wise 
men and women who insisted that AA be made as broad as uh, possible. That instead of uh, saying experience as such, we would talk about awakening somehow. And we would say that this would come about by following the 12 steps as best we could. And above all, the phrase, God as you understand him, which opened up uh, AA, it seems to me, to anyone not only in this world but on Mars or in the atmosphere above Phoenix or wherever we find, we find UFOs. If, if I had been told that I had to worship a particular way or think a particular way, I, I wouldn't be talking here to you today. I'd be dead, I, I know, because I, I, it had to be wide enough uh, for me and for, uh, for anyone. Well, to get to the point of this little anecdote, one day I was uh, at Lois's, and she said, why, uh, she said, Fran, why don't you wander around the house if you'd like to? and Go anywhere you want. And I said, well, really? Oh, I'd love that. So I went upstairs into Bill's bedroom, and I saw a bookcase. And I looked, uh, looked at the bookcase, and there was the varieties of religious experience. I thought, well, it can't be Bill's. You know, but, but. So I, I went around the bed, and I took it carefully out, and I, and I got down on my stomach. So you couldn't see me if you walked down the hallway. <laughs> and I opened it up, and there were all Bill's notes in the Brides of Religious Prayer. Well, I'm telling you, my heart really went through a palpitation. Because by, by looking at it, and I just, I was only up there a few minutes really kind of glancing at it, but I, I, I could see Bill's, I recognized his handwriting, I could see his intense interest in, in James. And of course, I connected this to what he says in A Comes of Age about the influence in his own thinking of James. And I could feel uh, the connection there, and I realized that one of the reasons I was alive right there reading that was that was that Bill W. had been interested in William James and had used ideas from the varieties of religious religious experience. So to me, it was very, very meaningful. I put it back. In fact, I, I, I told the story later to our archivist, uh, to Frank, and uh, made sure that book is in the New Jersey vault, and that's where it is now. But but someday I'd like to see a. Uh, if not a pamphlet, maybe even a small book done about uh, about that. Don't you think that'd be interesting? Yeah, yeah. I, I brought it up in the literature committee, but nothing's been done, done about it uh, ever since. Uh, nothing been done about it yet. But um, but uh, we will see. Well, uh, I had so many uh, again wonderful experiences that uh, I uh, just choke up even even trying to think about him. I remember reading How It Works to a number of people who had helped write it, and they were all kind of kidding me and trying to get me to, to laugh. I started crying I, because they were sitting in front of me, and they had supplied words and phrases and clauses for the How It Works section that we take such pride in reading at the beginning uh, uh, of our meetings. Um, I discovered... Uh, in all of those years of traveling, uh, much variation in meetings. It's, it's very fascinating that wherever I went, I would discover that the people there in the program felt that they had the program as it should be. And they were concerned about others out here. Who, uh, for instance, I was in many areas where the Lord's Prayer was intentionally not said because they were afraid it was too, identified too much with a specific uh, religion, or if it was said, it was always said in rotation uh, with uh, other prayers, an American Indian prayer, Buddhist prayer, and so on. Some places where, uh, I remember at one time there was one group had 4,000 members, one GSR. <laughs> honestly, honestly, uh, and they just thought that was, you know, fine. It just it kept growing. It, it really was, it, it was a whole city, what it was. It was one... Uh, it was one uh, group. I've been to places where you only had speaker meetings. The idea of a, of a discussion meeting or set meeting had never really percolated into the brains of, uh, of, of the people. And uh, um, other, pe uh, other areas where there was a constant debate between the, again, the, between the difference between a meeting and a group. Other areas where no one seemed to make the distinction at all. Some areas where Alano or Alano, as it usually said, clubs were very, very strong. And other areas where they were just loathed and hated and you know, hardly permitted <laughs> to, uh, to, uh, to exist. Um, the, some some uh, areas where uh, there was great fear of what was going on in New York, you know, and, and other areas where 
uh, was agreement that New York, uh, what was going on in New York was good and was, uh, uh, was effective. So I found that all very, very uh, fascinating, and uh, uh, it, it, I think, attested to the, uh, to the spirit and the vitality of AA throughout the world. I've been fortunate to be uh, to travel in many places. Ideology, no matter what religion, no matter what theological position, no matter what uh, political position, uh, there is nothing that will not fit in our big book, which is pretty amazing, isn't it? When you, when you think that the book is that that broad and that uh, uh, wide. Um, I worked uh, for a while with a, uh, a Russian, uh, this was during the Cold War too, with a, with a Russian psychologist about producing a, um, a book that talked more about the varieties of our higher power as we, as we perceived it. But that's, that, that work has not been done. It still hasn't been published. As a matter of fact, there was a lot of opposition to it in a conference by those who said, look, we have enough, we've said enough about that and uh, we don't need to do any more. A- actually, I think we do. I think that a pamphlet or a short book talking about how broad our appeal is would be, uh, would be helpful. Uh, in Russia, for instance, still uh, today you have a great many, particularly young people, who believe in uh, communism and the, the kind of theological implications of certain kinds of so-called scientific uh, Hegelian communism. And they want to be in AA and, and they... Whenever I would meet them, I would say, "Look, there's no problem. Fine, think exactly what uh, what you wish. You're perfectly welcome. There's only one requirement, and that's a desire to stop drinking." Now, but many of them still feel uneasy. And uh, I want to talk about Romania for a few minutes, but just to go ahead and mention that I I had many students in Romania. I became very close to them, who were uh, very devoted to communists, but who wanted, who were very interested in the principles of AA, but thought that a, the thought from their point of view that, well, AA is too much of a religion and so on and we're not welcome. I would say, no, no, no. Au contraire. You're t- totally, absolutely welcome with, uh, with open arms. So we are, uh, we are uh, as a fellowship, doing a great deal to bring the, 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 the message of AA to Eastern Europe and to Russia, but, it, but at times it's, uh, it's difficult. Hope this will, will change for the better uh, in, the, in the future as time, as time goes by. Um, I mentioned that, that, that I wanted to say a few words about uh, uh, Romania and that uh, Jan and I went over there. I uh, went over there as a Fulbright uh, professor to uh, lecture in uh, American literature, 20th century American literature, to uh, uh, Romanian uh, uh, students. And uh, I uh, was sent to um, a city in the uh, western province called in uh, Transylvania, really, called um, Timisoara, and uh, there was no AA at all. No one had ever heard heard uh, the uh, the letters, and uh, so Jan and I, in fact, we took we took the children with us. We thought it was going to be something of a lark, but it uh, really wasn't. It was uh, it was uh, horrendous. I mean, there was uh, there were armed guards everywhere, and dogs, and machine guns, and no very very little food. I mean, people. Not exactly starving, but you know that you could always get enough bread. But it had sawdust mixed in it. it was bad. Um, the one thing you could get, interestingly, all the time at cheap prices was uh, an apricot brandy, uh, zuinka, and uh, it was it was pretty cheap. And I think that was intentional on the part of the government to keep the the population uh, somewhat uh, mollified. But the the Romanians had been through uh, everything, subjugation for 2,600 uh, years, and they were used to it. In fact, a Romanian joke tells the whole story, and that he says, "What's a Romanian uh, pessimist?" Uh, he says, "Things can't get worse." Uh, well, what's a Romanian optimist? Well, a Romanian opti- optimist says, "Oh, yes, they can." <laughs> See, a joke doesn't make any sense in in our country. We're we're so blessed with ample food and, and warmth and, and so on. But uh, the conditions in, in Romania were shocking in the extreme to, to, uh, to, to Jan and to Fran and to the two children. I mean, to get up in the morning and worry about finding enough uh, food uh, to survive that day and worrying about the secret police. They were, they were listening into our uh, phone and they, they were, I, there were informers in my classes and I, I had to be very careful. And... Uh, um, but it was an extraordinary experience, and uh, 
uh, Jan stayed uh, a little over half a year with the children, and then we wanted them to come back to Spokane because Jenny was due to graduate at Ferris, and we wanted her to have that experience. So we got out of the country, which was very difficult. I mean, I, uh, uh, via the uh, uh, Orient Express, which was quite an adventure because it was filled with spies. Uh, I don't know what they were spying on, like who gave a damn, but there were there were rumors about the breakup. Then uh, this was uh, eight, this was uh, ten years ago, and there were rumors about the breakup of of uh, communism. But no one, I don't think anyone particularly uh, believed them. But there was all kinds of talk about a revolution in uh, Romania and uh, Ceausescu. If you remember, that was the mad leader in uh, Romania was was quite a quite a character his wife Elena they were the Juan Peron and Avita of Eastern Europe and I, th I think really honest to God they were mad just absolutely mad they had they had rules and regulations you can't believe they described everything as scientific socialism that was their name for communism communism was a distant dream it would come eventually for, for now we have scientific uh, socialism and when he would appear in town, everyone had a particular position you had to stand in in the streets. You know, you're supposed to be over here in this corner and, and so on. And I, wa I was not allowed out of the university building. <laughs> Took care of Pollock. And uh, uh, it, 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 it was incredible. The, as, I, as I said, my mail was open and read, my phone. I remember one morning I decided to go to Greece and uh, I walked in the university and the dean uh, mentioned me to come in. He said, oh... Uh, Professor Pollock, I wanted to talk to you about going to Greece. Well, I had only mentioned it on the phone the night before to no one else. I'm, it was a new idea in my head. I was really uh, startled to be living. And, but as the Romanians say, behind every flower there's a Phillips, uh, meaning a little microphone in a... Uh, again, it wouldn't make any sense in, in America unless someone uh, explained it to you. Well, anyway, uh, we got out in the Orient Express and uh, to uh, Vienna which was wonderful, if you like whipped cream and all game. It was so great. And uh, Jan and, uh, well, we all, we all uh, kept going all, all the way to London. I, did, I didn't really want to go back, but I knew I had to. So I said goodbye to Jan and the children. They flew back. And I went back in the Orient Express to, uh, to uh, Transylvania uh, by myself. And now I was really kind of in trouble because I, I, had, I needed to be at the Universitate all day, which meant I couldn't stand in line. Everything was, you had to stand in line for everything. And the value of what was at the end of the line was proportional to the length of the line. Uh, you know, like a two-block line might be onions. Well, terrific, you know, real, uh, real onions. Or like if it was a six-block line, maybe, oh, eggs. And uh, one-quarter of a block line, bread. <laughs> Who cared? <laughs> and so you would, you, all Romanians stand in line. They all seem related. They, no matter where you are in line, you started chatting about the same subjects with whoever you were with. It was kind of amazing, one big... Uh, one big uh, family. So my health started to go to hell. I, I just wasn't getting enough food, not, not for the right food. And uh, the, the communists, they, they liked me, and they dragged me around here and there. I was quite willing. I was happy to do it. Lecturing on uh, American literature. And I was never censored in any way, interestingly, and, and ne never once. And they, um, they, they were very, they actually were very good to me in taking me here and there and, uh, give, uh, you know, as a guest uh, lecturer. And uh, one one night I was in my apartment with my one sixty bulb, sixty watt bulb. That's all you were allowed to have. And I knock on the door, and it it was someone who was rather famous now in the fellowship. Really, uh, we called her Juliet for years because we were afraid of the authorities uh, wrecking havoc with her family. But her name is actually uh, Rotika, and she she came in and went like went, went like this and wanted to write and wrote out something in the dimness. This sounds weird. You would never do it in America, but there, kind of standard operating procedure. And she said, uh, "Follow me." Well, she exited, and I followed her and went to her apartment. Walked in, another sixty watt bulb. There's Mama, her Mama, sitting at a dining room table. Kitten, kitten there. And Rodika says, "I know. I heard you, Professor Pollock." And uh, there was something about your your speech that I just wanted to talk to you more. Now this often happened to me, and they people wanted to talk about America or freedom or something. If you, if you could trust them, see you're wary of everyone. Like I I, I didn't know Rodika was is she trying to entrap me in some way or another? Well, I don't know, but I don't know. You just take a chance in life at times. And so I talked to her about America and so on and so on, and we kept talking. And I, 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 I didn't get it somehow. I didn't get it. And then she said something. She said, "You know, I wrecked a car a number of years ago." Little ding, little bell went off. You wrecked the car. She said, "Yeah." She said it was Suica, though. 
And she says, you know, Sweeka does terrible things to you. And I said, you know, I, I, I drank too much in my life. And she said, you didn't. And we started talking, both of us, in a rush, and it dawned on me, and it's an amazing revelation to me, that she somehow felt the existence of AA in me without me saying anything about it. She, she had, she was very smart. She had somehow picked up something in my talk about literature uh, that I didn't, I didn't know was in, even in there. And so I said, wait here, and I ran back to my apartment and got some literature, which I had hidden from the police. You couldn't have any literature of that. And incidentally, any, any organization, including AA, was illegal because the communists thought it might be used as a revolutionary front. They were quite right, but, uh, but it wasn't AA. I wouldn't do that, of course. Well, any, anyway, she started reading all the material and immediately saw the point. She saw the beauty of AA. She saw the applicability of AA to her, to her own life. And uh, she just started crying and reading and crying and reading. She's very, very fluent in English and uh, still is to this day. In fact, she's in America right now. And I, I was just overwhelmed. I, I, I couldn't believe it because Jan and I had had our meetings. We, we for, for, formed a group. We called it Grupa Una, number, number one in the Romanian. And we were the only two members. In fact, after Jan left, I was the only member uh, left. That, that was it. And so I, to, I, I began to talk to Radhika about how we have meetings and what the fellowship means. And, and Kurt, again, she's very smart. She picked, she picked, she picked it up just like, and she's so much like Fran and that she too had felt that moral uh, guilt very strong in, in Romania and that it was her fault and so on, so on, so on. So immediately she said, she said, you know, she said, we have to see my friend Vicky. She needs this more than I do. You remember that feeling you want to sober up the whole world? She immediately thinks of, of someone else. And so we started having uh, meetings. And uh, we had to be afraid of the authorities. We couldn't meet in my room for an apartment for various reasons, and we, uh, obvious reasons, I should say. And we couldn't in Rodica's either. We met in the back room of Vicky's quite often, or we were peripatetic. We'd meet at the vegetable uh, place, and we'd walk down the street uh, having a meeting as we, as we walked, as if we were just friends who had, who had just met. And everyone walked there, and uh, very, very few had cars. Maybe one in a thousand would have a, an uh, automobile. And so that's how AA got, uh, got started there. And I, I'm happy to tell you that uh, Grupo Una is, uh, is still, uh, still there. It's, it's, it, well, it grows and it gets smaller. It grows and it gets smaller. It was up to about 16 members uh, a couple of years ago. Now I think it's... Uh, it's uh, less than that. R uh, Rodika left. She came to America. First time she came from America, she brought the Romanian flag down, the flag ceremony at uh, Seattle. If you were there, you saw her do that. That was a tremendous, tremendously moving event uh, for all of us. We didn't know what to do with the Romanian flag because in the center of it was a uh, si uh, sickle and, uh, what do we say with communism? Right? Hammer and sickle, yeah. Uh, that's why I retired from... So... So we just bunched up the, the center with our hands and we just cut it with the scissors and there's a ragged hole. It looked great. And that's what she carried down, the Romanian flag, without the hammer and sickle uh, on it. And so now, in, interestingly, Rodica is uh, back in uh, Michigan and she's, uh, she's going to school, getting some more education. But she just had her, uh, what was her ninth or tenth? She, 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 her, birth, her sobriety date is uh, spring of 19... 85, so it was her, it was her 12th birthday. You guys can hardly believe that, that it's, it's, it's been that uh, uh, long. And, and as, you, as you'll know, if you, if you look at the, uh, the, the translations that are available now for sale in the fellowship, you'll notice quite a lot are Romanian, and Rodica translated most of those that are for sale now all around. So I, I think, I think you, you don't see her name, and of course there are no names of translators, but uh, I'm very uh, proud of her uh, for that. So when it came time for me to leave uh, Romania, uh, I was, uh, uh, I was uh, upset. I, 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 I had a terrible crisis in my own life in that I, I loved Jan so much and loved the children so much and loved Spokane, loved you all, and I didn't want to go. I mean, I... I mean, I felt, do you ever live your life all the way up to here when you feel you're using everything that you ever had? That's the way I felt in Romania. I mean, my students and the university and, and the A group and, and uh, I don't know, I guess I'm a born martyr. I, 
and uh, so I. But the day, the 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 day to go finally came. That is the night before, and the the uh, university officials wanted me to stay for some photographs. And I thought that was a little weird, kind of funny. They never done it before. But anyway, I went home that night to my apartment, and it had been ransacked by the Securitate, the dreaded uh, secret police, and. Uh, they had uh, destroyed all the my A tapes. <laughs> Can you believe this? They, many of the A tapes sent from uh, Spokane. They were afraid of them. Apparently, I mean, I, I'm still not absolutely sure, but I, uh, that, that's what all the A's uh, fe- uh, felt at the time. Um, I had been given a lot of messages to take out, messages having to do with uh, this and that, and the next thing. And uh, I guess I'm still cautious about talking about them. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to throw these away because, as you know, I'm kind of chicken because I was afraid if I got on the train with these messages at the border, I'd be in big trouble if anyone could read English and see them. So I was going to drop them down the toilet. Then I, then I thought, well, I, I really knew courage by then because I had discovered, you know, in AA, all you have to do is reach your hand out to that higher power as you perceive the higher power and you have all the strength that you need. And I stood there in that uh, lonely uh, Romanian uh, apartment with that 60 watt bulb burning and reached out my hand and I knew I couldn't throw the messages away so I thought of a way to trick them I I had some of Shachescu's speeches to take out as souvenirs and so I took all the messages and I just ripped them apart into small pieces of paper and then assembled them so they work and then used the first letter of a particular Shachescu speech first word first letter second word first letter third and put that in a little pencil marks. So I knew that more or less I could reassemble these all by just having the speech. And that's what I did. And then when I finished ripping them all up, I sprinkled these little pieces of paper all throughout my notes. And it looked like a typical messy professor. And uh, so in the morning, I didn't sleep the whole night. I was afraid. To. In the morning, there were all uh, the, 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 my uh, close friends, students and AA members combined. And uh, I said goodbye, but it was a it was a most worst goodbye. It was like absolutely seeing death in everyone's face there, and I I knew what was ahead for them. Most probably was death, an early death from working too hard in this country, uh, a death, uh, a spiritual death because of inadequate food, inadequate medical attention, uh, living a horrible life under a dictatorship that called itself communist but was really a an old-fashioned dictatorship. And I knew I was going back to the land of milk and honey, to Spokane, to Eden, to heaven. And uh, I, they, they almost had to carry me, put me on that train. But that's, that's what they did. Incidentally, I really never would have come back, I don't think, when I found out later that they had lied to me and that they had been harassed by the secret police, had been called downtown, investigated, what are you doing with the American professor and why are you together, so and so and so on, all kinds of Harassment uh, techniques have been used that I didn't know about. They they wouldn't tell me they were so so wonderful. Well, the train started and we went to the border. It took about two hours to get to the border near Belgrade uh, in uh, Yugoslavia, and uh, the train stopped and they came looking for me. Well, that really frightened me, and jerked me off the train with my luggage, took me away to a jail. Actually, I shouldn't call it jail. It was a holding area in the station for interrogation, and. Uh, went through my things, began finding this and that, really frightened me. And a young uh, soldier standing there with a machine gun uh, pointed at me. And, but they couldn't really find anything. Uh, that was, they, they thought, I, they were looking for, particularly for manuscripts because they knew I was a writer and so on, but I had already sent them out through the American embassy. I thought of that. And so finally, after about an hour of this, and they're holding all these other people on the train, <laughs> It's because of all this because of Spokane AA, really. <laughs> and uh, so they picked up a bunch of my stuff and hit me in the stomach intentionally. They just sho- shoved it at me and said, get back on train. And uh, I really wanted to run back in that train like Bugs Bunny, but for once in my life, I sauntered out like John Wayne. I figured, <laughs> might as well. Just took my time, <laughs> climbed on the on the train and... Suddenly we started up and we started going through the plowed land. They plowed the land and it had land landmines in it. The, the plowed land so you couldn't run very fast. 
in Lambda, the tall wooden sentry towers with machine guns on top and uh, searchlights. It was like something out of Stalag 17 movie. And uh, thank God it's finally uh, broken down. The the sharpshooters were along the riverbank. If uh, Romanians tried to swim the Danube over to Yugoslavia, they'd be shot in the head. If they did get to Yugoslavia, roughly half of them were, would be allowed out to a refugee camp near Rome, uh, Italy. The other half would be sent back. That was a strange kind of informal arrangement that Romania had with Yugoslavia at the time. Can you imagine human beings being forced to live this way? No matter the, you understand now why the revolution happened, and you understand also why Ceausescu and his wife were put to death by those who captured them. I had hoped they wouldn't. I would hope they would live, but they were summar they were summarily executed by the uh, revolutionaries. Many of them from Timișoara, and some of them actually my uh, my students. So I I I found myself out in uh, in Belgrade and hopped on a train as quickly as I could to. Uh, over to uh, Trieste and to uh, Venice, and you and you walk into Venice finally, and I'm telling you, it's a, it's incredible. It's like w going from a black and white universe to a Technicolor movie. Suddenly, you see everyone walking. They're walking down, eating ice cream cones and Hershey bars and oranges, and you see plump people. You don't see everyone's thin uh, in Romania. And I can't tell you how thrilled I was, and I was able to call Jan and talk to her uh, honestly for the first time in many many months because I was afraid to uh, otherwise. So I finally, I, I came home, of course, and resumed my life here, and uh, Rodika uh, came over, and she stayed with us for a while, and she stayed in Seattle, and she participated in the, in the uh, uh, Seattle uh, International. As I said, she's, she's uh, still here, and she served, as I said, she's rather famous now in Eastern Europe, interestingly, in that she's known as the, that, Ro that Romanian lady which, who started AA in that part <laughs> that part of the world. So so this is how our fellowship has grown from Akron, you know, to Cleveland, to Chicago, to someone hearing about it and starting it in LA and so on. We've never had any kind of successful planned growth in the fellowship and I think that's a real testament to, to what we are. Uh, we 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 just we just we just don't believe in that. We we believe in letting the the message grow wherever the the seed is uh, somehow, and over and over and over again, AA has grown because of the influence of one person, one man or one woman, who found this message of uh, of joy, and uh, tried to uh, tried to pass it on. So you can imagine why I'm as as grateful as I am. You know, John had that wonderful list at the end of his talk. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I've got a couple to add to it. You know, like I always try to correct someone when he says, well, you'll fall off the pink cloud sooner or later. I mean, it'll probably be sooner. I always say, well, I, I've been in the program 31 years now, and I have not flown, uh, dropped off the pink cloud. I mean, if you want to talk about being off the pink cloud, that was my life before AA. I mean, the life since AA has, has been incredible. Sure, there have been bad days and tragedies in my life and this and this and that, but but... I have a way to cope now. Uh, I, I have a way. Of, Bob Bob Pierce, the general manager, uh, a number of years ago for for a, I think said something profound uh, when he said, you know, he said, you know, he said uh, my problem was not coping with alcohol. I mean, I got along fine with alcohol. My problem was coping without alcohol, coping with sobriety. I said, Bob, that's it. That's it, exactly. And, and he said, to the extent I drank, I just avoided coping with what was really bothering me, and that was reality. That was, uh, that was a sober, uh, sober, sobriety. And I said, that's, that's absolutely it. And I said, that's what A gives us, uh, isn't it? It gives us a way to live happily in a sober uh, universe, a universe in which we're not killing ourselves, a, a universe which offers us, uh, offers us hope instead of uh, uh, depression, uh, promise instead of... Uh, uh, despair, uh, fulfillment instead of uh, failure. And it doesn't matter whether we're 36, as I was when I came in the program, or 24, or, or 43. Bill and I were talking in, uh, at, at dinner, and, and, and we, we agreed that it seems to take what it, take, what it takes to take somehow, but that I needed to have every last drink that I, that I had somehow, and so did, so did you. And so we came in because we hit that perfect little window, and we were given that initial gift of sobriety, and then that strange, mysterious voice 
uh, said to us, it's up to you now. You, if, you, if you want to hold on to this, uh, you can. The, the higher power is here for you. All you need to do, you don't need to understand it, and you just, just reach out your hand and it uh, will be there. So for that I am very, very grateful and I thank you for listening to me tonight. Thank you. Thank you.